Hi guys, thanks for watching this video. I'm hoping you're enjoying the series so far. Um, in this video, we're going to be finally wiring up the enclosure. So we're going to be putting in the servo drives, we're going to be putting the stepper motor drive, the power supplies that go with that, the main contactor, and the breakout board that links all of them together, as well as the motion controller. We're going to finish off mounting this on the wall, and then we're going to fire up the CNC machine. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it looks really good in the end, so if you just want to see the final product, maybe skip to the end. Otherwise, we're in for some fast forwarding and some wiring. So over here I'm wiring in my servo drives, so from the far left I'm wiring in um, my x-axis and then I've got my y-axis in the middle and then I've got my spindle motor on the right. So for my x-axis and my spindle motor I'm using um, a 14 AWG cable um, and then for my y-axis I'm using a 16 AWG cable. So the peak inrush current for my x-axis is around 12 amps. Um, I expect that current is not going to be there for long, I think it's rated for one second. Um, but the actual nominal current for the x-axis is 4 amps. Um, the spindle drive is respectively 6 amps and 18 amps peak and then the actual y-axis is a 3 amps and 9 amps peak. So the cable itself, the 16 AWG cable for the y-axis should be fine for that current. Um, the x-axis should also be fine for that current however the spindle motor, well that's on its edge. I um, probably should have rated a slightly thicker cable for that. However I suspect the actual spindle drive itself probably won't be swinging large loads here and there so um, hopefully I won't come anywhere close to that peak current. Um, I'm actually wiring in all the actual cables into a distribution terminal block so I collect all the live and neutrals and then I wire it into there and the idea is the live on those distribution blocks are um, switched by the contactor. So the actual cables themselves are actually routed through the back of the case, so I've wired them through and through the back, and that's actually fine, there's ample room there, so that actually works quite well for me. Um, I've also been a bit naughty, and what I've done is I've used the earth that actually runs through these cables, and I've also used one of the power transmission lines, so it's a three phase cable, and it's, run, it's got an earth running through, so I've used two of the phases for my neutral and power, or my neutral and live, and I've used the earth and another phase for my auxiliary braking resistor which is a little bit naughty I've actually got the earth for each of the respective drives widened through the back plate which should be fine but um, I've actually widened the cables and the auxiliary resistors just in case I need to actually put those resistors in later on to actually help the servo drives break the actual loads themselves So I've uh, mounted the servo cables against the actual earth back plate and then what I'm doing is I'm using some motherboard standoffs to actually raise the breakout board which nicely hides away all the cables behind so and uh, makes it really easy to connect up the breakout board as well. So you've just seen me do some soldering on this board and effectively what I was doing is I'm soldering in the safety system. So um, all of these control my safety inputs and outputs. So the bottom five over here, so 27 to the bottom one there, that's all of my inputs, all my safety inputs and then the top three are my safety outputs. So what happens is if my inputs, which are on this side, and my outputs are on this side. If any of my inputs go low, so if any of them float or they go to zero, then it sees that as a problem, it sees that as a safety problem. So this is an active low, so it expects to see a 5 volt, and then if the 5 volt is present, the safety system in that regard is off. So if any of the inputs go low, then that's triggered over here, and it's the same with the servo drive, if any of them go low, then that is triggered over here. So um, what I've done is I've used some Schmidt triggers on my um, 
on my inputs because it helps with noise immunity. So if anything is below that Schmidt trigger threshold, um, it sees it as a problem. So I've got the jumper pins at the back simply to enable or disable my system. So 27 and 26 over here are disabled. What I've done is I've shorted those two to, to 5 volts. So the system sees that as I've got a 5 volt supply, everything's fine on those inputs. I can still use the inputs over here as my uh, standard inputs. They're still connected to the motion controller and they will happily work. It's just they're not influenced or they're not influencing the safety system. So if anything happens in them, the safety system doesn't see it. However, 25 and 26 I have connected. So 25 is my e-stop. My e-stop comes along. It's otherwise 5 volts. The moment I hit the e-stop, it floats it or it goes to ground. And then it triggers that input there. And it also sends a command to Mac3 to put it in emergency stop. So an e-stop mode. 26 is the same. That's connected to my um, stepper motor which is just over there, you can just see it there. But that's the alarm from the stepper motor that comes in. And that in turn, when that goes to zero, or when that's not connected to five volts anymore, that in turn sends that into a safe mode. So I've also got a jumper pin right at the bottom, right at the bottom over here, and that's my feedback. So if any of these or any of the inputs go low, or if any of the servo motors go low, so if I have a problem, it always sends, if this is connected to the bottom, it sends the signal all the way back and it pulls 25 low. And the intention there is it sends a signal back to Mac3, so it puts um, the whole system into an e-stop if any of the drives or if any of the configured inputs go low. Um, the outputs themselves are sync, so if anything happens when which the e-stop is triggered, what it's going to do is it's going to pull these down to zero. So um, the inputs on here are 9, 10, 11 and 12, however what I can do, I can disable those outputs by jumping. So if they're not jumped, effectively nothing happens, but if they are jumped, then I'm going to pull that output to ground when the safety system is triggered. So in this instance what I've done is I've connected my enable on my drive to that there. So if any of, if I have a fault, if I have a safety system fault, it pulls that enable down and the servo, so it's a stepper driver for my z-axis, is off. So it's off. Um, the same is with my servo motors. So they're working a very similar system. They've got jumper pins over here. The two prong ones are for my um, output from my servo motors. So when they're connected, if I have a problem in any of those, it sends that signal through. If I disconnect that, then effectively if I have a problem with that, the safety system doesn't see it. Um, with those ones there, so that three pin over there, the bottom is the bottom pin which is not connected, so that tab right there, that's ground, but a, and then if you short ground to the middle pin, that would effectively um, disable that servo driver. When I mean disable, I mean the safety system on the servo driver is disabled. But what I've done is I've connected it now, so if that goes into, uh, or if the safety system itself goes into an emergency state mode, what it does is it pulls that right down, and then it puts that into a safety mode. So that's the intention. The intention is if I have a problem with any of my inputs, if I have a problem with any of my inputs uh, or any of my server motors, then I can stop. Everything stops. Everything's connected to each other. So it's going to tell each of the server motors in hardware, I've got a problem, and then it puts them in e-stop e mode, irrespective of Mac3. So I think things are looking quite good. I have wired in my servo drivers or the power to the servo drivers. Um, they all come into this terminal block over here. So I've got the neutral always connected uh, and then the live switches on and off using this contactor here. I think the reason why you might want to, don't quote me on this, I'm not an electrician, but if you keep the neutral always connected, I think somewhere along the power transmission lines, that's connected to ground. So if you were to go and touch it and if everything's wired correctly, you, you shouldn't get electrocuted. However, if you were to touch the live, well, <laughs> happy day was, goodbye. But um, 
Yeah, so the live switches, I couldn't find a contactor that could actually fit inside my case that runs off 24 volts. So I've rated this one, well this one's rated 240 on the core side of things. Um, I can't run 240 straight into the relays over here, which can, you know, controlled by my charge pump, simply because of isolation, um, like the, it's like the clearances on the actual tracks are not big enough. I might change that in future revision boards, but at the moment, that's, the board's not rated for it. So, um, yeah, the intention is to switch that or switch a 5 volt. So use that to switch a 5 volt relay which sits over here, which in turn switches 240 volts in this actual relay or in this contactor. It's a bit of a long way of doing things, but um, it should work fine. And if I can come up with a better solution or a better relay in the future, I'll um, maybe do that. I thought about using maybe one of the Siemens relays. I thought about using something like like this and then uh, I think each of the channels are ready for 10 amps and then shorten each one so like having them all common but um, bad idea because you don't know which of the contactors or which of the terminals each of the switches inside here is going to hit first so you might have an overload of current through one of them and then yeah, it's goodbye so it's just going to weld itself shut so anyway <clears throat> That's that. I've used um, the actual drives themselves are wired in through these cables over here and I've used 16 AWG for this one and 14 AWG for the other two. It should be fine for like the length of wire that I actually got in here. And then um, I've used some thicker cables to run in for the main ter terminal. I think these are 5mm cross section so that's quite thick. Um, so they should handle the current just fine. I think um, total peak inrush current for that one there is about 9.5 amps. That one there, I think it's 12.5, and I think that one there, don't quote me, it might be 15. So that's 1.8 kilowatt server drive. That one there is my 0.75 kilowatt server drive, and that one there is my kilowatt. So who knows what actually goes on in the actual drive itself. I think the, the actual current is rated for the motor. I can't find any specs on these actually. So my limiting factor, so my limiting bottleneck in terms of current going through this is actually my, um, it's my, it's my uh, power input. So this connector, which you can't see, it's off camera, but <laughs> believe me, it's, uh, it's 32 amps, that's rated to. This over here is rated to 63 amps. I'm only using a single pole, so it's a dual pole. Um, contactor but I'm only using a single pole to switch the live but and that's rated to 63 amps so what I'll do is I'll put a, uh, I'll put a <coughs> just a fuse just an inline fuse uh, outside of this cabinet that would just like limit the current going in to about 32 amps which should be fine for this actual um, connector so <coughs> everything else is connected I just need to connect up these servo driver cables and they're a bit of a pain because um, well Effectively, I can't find, well, I can find the right cable that runs all the way through. I need twisted pair cables running all the way through this, but the actual diameter on the twisted pair cables is so big, and um, the only supplier that actually does the cable that I require, Farnell, um, is out of stock until the end of August. I uh, don't really fancy waiting a month, so I'm going to use two cables. It's going to be fine. You'll see it in the later on village when I, or videos when I carry on, but... Uh, I'm just going to have to solder these into the receptacle which are 3D printed, which look great. So shout out to my housemate Johnny, he's actually done this for me. That's really good, he's using the dual extruded nozzle, so I think that's come out real nice. Um, I could have bought one of these, it's actually a standard component, but um, they cost like £7 each, and I needed three of them, so well, 3D printing works for me. Um, yeah, I've got to cut these cables to length, and then... Um, while they're more than so that's remaining and then I've got a couple of cables or a couple of um, cables that I need to extend so they can extend out into the cabinets because currently these cables are a little bit too short now at the moment and then after that I'll be done so I'll continue on this video and then you'll see everything come together